thank you so much for inviting me tonight. When, when I see this crowded room, I know that you've got a fantastic campaign going because that's really what, what, worked, what we did in Lewisham. We had a massive campaign. We had loads of people involved. And it was the force of the campaign that actually helped us to win. Okay, we had a judicial review and that was convenient that there was a flaw in the legislation that enabled us to challenge a decision. But we would never have had the courage to take that review judicial review or to do any of the things we do without this uh, thousands of people involved in our campaign. And um, it's just about a year ago today, that, um, not today, 26th of January, that we have had a demonstration in Lewisham of 25,000 people. And the way we built that campaign is really important. And I, I think this is how you're building your campaign here. I think, I think that's, that, that's the way to do it. We had a really broad-based campaign. We, had, we included everybody that agreed with us we wanted to save our local hospital, no matter what their political background. So we had, we had lots of people who were not in any parties, who were not sort of political in that sense. We had the Labour Party involved, we had lots of other smaller political parties, and we had a broad united front. But more than that, we had church groups and faith groups, we had the local football clubs, we had local small businesses, pharmacies, pubs, did pub quizzes for us, um, schools, colleges, university, local university, everybody across the spectrum. We were lucky to have our local GPs. I'm a, I'm a GP, I've been a GP in Lewisham for 20 years. And we were really lucky we had the backing of our local GPs to, to, to oppose the closure of our local hospital because they really valued it. And I don't think all is lost here because I don't think these clinical commissioning groups everywhere represent, really represent the grassroots GPs who are often quite quiet and a bit cowardly, I would say, but they become less cowardly if they think their patients are getting bothered. So I think go and, you know, lobby, lobby your local GP practice and ask them what they think of, of these plans. And you'll be surprised that some people might, some of them might start to come out of their shell. We were lucky that we had our local clinical commissioning group backing us. We had our local council backing us, um, which was fantastic. And I think they would have backed us anyway, but when they saw the thousands, tens of thousands of people who were protesting and angry about the, um, the proposal to close our hospital. Well, it gave the council a bit of a, you know, bigger, stronger backbone too, and they, they really backed us financially and in every other way. We had the support of our local MPs, all three of our MPs, our Labour MPs, they all supported us fantastically. And there was something about just bringing together at all the sections of the community with one focus that made us so powerful. And I would say to you that that is the way forward for any community campaign that hopes to to save this local hospital. We also used you know, imaginative ways of reaching out to people. Um, Anne's idea of having a poster, a poster you put in your windows, that's what we did. We had eye-catching posters with simple, clear messages. We gave them away free at a Saturday stall, and people came and put them up in their windows. Just great, and if you drove around or walked down or took the bus down any street in Lewisham, you could see three or four or five or six of our posters mm -hmm. in the windows. So that's the sort of thing that we did. We had people coming up and volunteering to do a video for us or a rap song or, or something. And I think being open to all the talents that are out there who want to come and help is a great way of, of building a creative and imaginative and eye-catching and sort of inclusive uh, movement. Because I think that's what we're talking about, a movement to, to, to change. As you're coming up to this pre-election time, as other speakers have mentioned, this is a time of crucial, you know, everybody's very sensitive, politicians are very sensitive at this time. And this is a, a, a really important pressure point for you. Um, I think if you can do this, if you can, if you can carry this off, you may very, I can't say easily, but you may, may very well manage to save your hospital because the evidence is on your side. The, the crisis in our AMEs is tremendous. The crisis in our hospitals, um, as the, the doctor who spoke earlier said, how, what, how can you contemplate closing AMEs when the current ones are overflowing? And the problem with AME is nothing to do with the lies that the government says about the GP contract or this and that. It's like actually the crisis in AME is a crisis of capacity. The hospitals do not have the capacity to actually admit patients um, into the wards because there are not enough beds. We've already lost um, something like 8,000 beds um, in, in, in the last four or five years. We've lost about half of our beds across in the last 20 years. There aren't beds to admit patients into. The patients that are in the beds already, many of them elderly, um, are not able to be moved out because of the drastic cuts in social services. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to convey how serious that is. Many elderly and disabled people no longer qualify for any kind of help at all. There is a, a huge backlog of people just to, just to get um, what's called 
called banded in order to be assessed about how much, um, what kind of care they can get. So if you're cutting social services and you're closing beds and you're getting rid of doctors and nurses, we've lost about 6,000 nurses in the last well, four years, um, <coughs> then you can see why there's a crisis in the A&E. So it's a crisis of capacity, a crisis due to cuts. So if they're closing more hospitals and A&Es, what's going to happen? And we're going to see that. It's going to make the, um, the headlines. But what we mustn't do is buy into the way the government tries to excuse that by saying, oh, it's lazy doctors or bad nurses or lazy GPs or this, that and the other. We must make it very clear that the, this crisis is due to these cuts and we cannot afford to cut any more hospitals. One of the things about Lewisham, which I really recognised when I, when I was reading the literature that your council put out saying that um, Children Cross Hospital had been saved, I really had a sense of deja vu because that's what they said about Lewisham. Originally they were proposing to close the A&E and maternity in Lewisham. And then we had our big demonstrations, 25,000 people, um, lots of other mass events, and that put pressure on the government. So then they made this announcement that they weren't going to close the a &E. They were going to just replace it with what they called a smaller, small but safe a &E. <laughs> <laughs> and All the headlines in all the papers, all the media, oh, Lucian a has been saved. A bit like what the headlines that you're getting. And it was just a load of rubbish, a small but safe a &E. This concept was challenged by our amazing emergency department a &E doctors, and we were so lucky to have our clinicians on our side. Mm -hmm. And they came up, they, they came up with detailed critique and said this is rubbish. Um, they even challenged the, um, Sir Bruce Keogh, who's the medical director of NHS, to say, where's the evidence that this small, safe a &E is actually more than an urgent care centre? And he couldn't come up with any evidence. It is an urgent care centre, that's all it is. The College of Emergency Medicine, which is a professional body which um, regulates and approves of it, <coughs> emergency departments, which is what you're supposed to call a &E, now, ED, um, says there's no such thing as a small a &E. You're either an a &E that can admit patients, sick patients, admit them into hospital. So you're admitting ho an admitting hospital, a district general hospital that can admit the vast majority of urgent conditions. And as our speaker, Dr. McGurk, said earlier, of course, you know, 5% of emergency admissions are heart attack, stroke, and major trauma. For several years in, Lew in London, these have already been going to specialist centres. And this, there is evidence that this is effective. And nobody, you didn't see mass campaigns against this because people could see there was a good clinical base for this. 95% of the conditions for which people need to be admitted to hospital, are, there's no evidence that they need to be uh, treated in big, major specialist centres. They are bread and butter work for uh, hospital doctors, emergency doctors, uh, emergency physicians, and surgeons, and pediatricians. They are your diabetic coma, your acute asthma, your bleeding ulcer, your woman who's bleeding in pregnancy if it's a, if it's a maternity, um, your renal failure, all those things. They are treated, your pneumonias, etc. They in, they are in our local hospitals very, very well. If we start channeling all these people into a few remaining so-called specialist centres, what will happen is those specialist centres will not be able to deal with the actual cases that they should be dealing with. They will just find themselves overwhelmed because okay. overall the number of beds is going to be shrunk. I think 300 beds in this area, I think 500 beds altogether. North West London, fewer beds, you'll get more blockages in A&E, you'll get the people who are really needing to have the, the clock busting drugs and everything being, being held back. So it's not an evidence-based plan. So we should really um, challenge those arguments. And as John Lister said, the other awful and dreadful argument I think is so cynical is this idea, well, we don't need beds because we're going to have all this community, care in the community. <laughs> Who wouldn't love to have better care in the community for people who didn't want to have to be admitted to hospital? Well, the, there are various problems with this. One is that there's no evidence that this would be any cheaper. It might even cost more. There's actually no evidence that it would stop emergency admissions. It may well be people still need to be admitted to hospital for workup for treatment, but then hopefully discharged earlier. There have no, been no pilots of it just to see what works. There's no money around for it. And you'd need to have a whole new army of district nurses and community matrons and more GPs if you were going to do that. There's no funding. They're cutting general practice and taking a billion pounds out of general practice in the last four years. It's all the talk about GPs getting too much money, it's the opposite. They've taken a billion pounds out of, out of funding in, in for primary care. Only five district nurses qualified in London last year. How are you going to sustain community care? 
launch if you this don't actually system. invest in training a new cohort of, of, of specialist um, nurses to do this. So it's completely cynical, they've got no intention whatsoever of, of doing that. So I think deal with the arguments because they are, their arguments are weak and ours are strong. Try to get your local GPs, your politicians, your MPs, your council, everybody, try to get the community involved. So. Use this as a basis, this great meeting, to go out and to, do, and to build up, because I think you've got every chance of winning if you do that. And we will be there, to, if you want any help or advice from people in the Lewisham, and we can come together much more across London to help each other, then, you know, we're offering that to the best of us.